the GOP health care bill, President Trump's wiretapping tweets, and a day without a woman. I'm Donna Davis, and this is The Square Circle. Welcome to the Square Circle. I'm your host, Donna Davis. Joining us today are Daniel Marins of the Huffington Post, conservative writer and editor Brian McNichol, and Kelly Vlahos of the American Conservative. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Great to be here. Republicans in the House of Representatives released their long-awaited health care bill this week but it has come under fire from many groups, even conservative ones. Here's the Wall Street Journal's coverage. Taking a step toward fulfilling their campaign promises, House Republicans released a proposal to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. The plan, called the American Health Care Act, would create a new refundable tax credit to replace federal insurance subsidies. It would freeze Medicaid expansion in 2020, defund Planned Parenthood, expand health savings accounts, eliminate fines for Americans who don't buy insurance, and repeal a mandate that requires larger businesses to provide health insurance to their employees. Daniel, do you think that this bill has a chance of passing? I think it does, but a lot of that depends on how much President Trump actually gets in the ring on this. And if he is going to get in the ring, that means things like not just having Ted Cruz over for dinner, but talking to some of these wayward members of the House Freedom Caucus and maybe even paying a visit to their district. I've just read that he's planning a rally in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm not sure how much good that will do, given that Bob Corker and Lamar Alexander, the two senators from Tennessee, are already in his corner. He needs to win over conservative members of the House, really, and some moderate members of the Senate, so folks like Susan Collins. How you bridge that divide in terms of making a bill that's acceptable to those two groups is going to be extremely difficult. I think that what the Republican Party is finding is that if it wants to preserve the good things about Obamacare, it is going to need to do some things that, that annoy people, just like the original bill did. And <laughs> they need to decide whether they consider it riskier to remove people from coverage in Republican states where it's made a positive impact or to err on the side of stripping out more of those subsidies which they've replaced with tax credits which conservatives have rightly pointed out are effectively something pretty similar. Um, if they want to err on the side of just reducing the law and reducing the impact of government in, in the health care system and whether that's the political risk that they want to take. I'm Fine, sorry. go ahead. Um, the, the, the speaker said today they're trying to do it in three steps. The first step is uh, this bill, which th they can do as part of budget re reconciliation, which means you don't need 60 votes to call it off the calendar. They could do it with 50 votes in the Senate. Um, this would be, you know, uh, eliminating the taxes and fees, eliminating the mandates and so forth. Uh, that which they can't do through this, they're going to have uh, Secretary Price, HHS, uh, remove regulations that uphold Obamacare. And then the plan is to come back later and ask for things like selling uh, state, uh, selling health care across state lines, uh, having that Geico Gecko, you know, preaching for, uh, you know, auto insurance and health insurance at the same time. Um, that's a tougher lift. I guess the theory is, uh, and I think this explanation was developed as use in response to the negative publicity as you were, you were talking about, um, I think it's sort of a bat, you know, instead of coming at it with this first, they came out with this second. But the last thing, you know, their hope is that as we get closer to 2018, there's 12 Democratic senators up in states, uh, Trump, President Trump won, and it's hoped they can get them to the table beside, behind something that uh, mm -hmm. saves money and, you know, is good. Now, you know, it's possible it works that way. It also must be remembered that you know, not a single Republican has ever voted for Obamacare or any aspect of it. 
Kelly, yeah. what's your position well, on that? Well, I'm just aghast because yeah. for the last two years or more of the campaign, we've been hearing about how awful the Democrats were when they rammed through Obamacare without bringing it to the American people, not reading bills, not hashing out legislation. And what we're seeing here is a disaster of a rollout in which a, a bill, you know, a proposal has been foisted upon us. They've already had one committee vote on it but there are no real details, and we don't know how much it's going to cost. And I think all Americans, Republican, Democrat, conservative, and liberal, had agreed that the, the biggest issue with Obamacare was the cost to individual uh, pockets and premiums, and they wanted those premiums to come down. They wanted to be able to afford health care, not just the access, but nothing that we're hearing today tells us, the American people, that the actual premiums are going down. And now they're saying there's going to be different phases and whatnot, and that will address it, but that, that shouldn't be good enough for the American people at this point. I'd like to remind our viewers that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air toward the end of the show. So, Kelly, tell me, it sounds like you're saying that across the board, and I think I'm hearing this from all our guests, across the board, the new bill answers nothing of what we as Americans have concerns about in terms of what health care and Obamacare is doing for us. Correct. I think what it answers is for, the, for those people who wanted to see a repeal of Obamacare, they're hearing this is going to be repealed. Fine. And that's political in nature. But I don't think we're hearing how that's going to happen. What I'm personally hearing is, you know, for 10 years or more, uh, Republicans have been, had talked about health savings accounts and tax credits as a way for, the, for this to be uh, a privately controlled management system as opposed to a government controlled management system. Fine. You know, they were elected. You have a Republican-controlled Congress and White House now, but I think, the re I think the responsible thing to do is to roll this out in a deliberative way in which we get the details about the cost and what it's going to cost, and we see it hammered out through hearings and meetings and committee. What, I'm, what the message that I think that I'm getting is that they want to, to get this through committee and markup as fast as possible. And I think that should make people a little nervous because they could be, they could be getting a whole new health care system um, that's half-baked, and that's not going to help. Health, care, health savings accounts are in the, in the bill, in this bill. Right. right. So, um, I mean, that's one big re reform there that, it, that Obamacare took away, gives you a little better chance of keeping your doctor and paying for it and so forth. But the, the, the problem is, you know, they have, a, they have two big problems. One is... They've been winning elections. You know, they've displaced a thousand Democratic state lawmakers, uh, what seventeen governors, taken over the Senate and the House uh, with with strong and strengthening majorities on the promise to get rid of this. So it, it, it wasn't a promise to do something later. It wasn't a promise to replace. It was a promise to repeal. So, but now you come to the reality of you have you've signed up all these people. You know, for for not just. Uh, Obamacare, but uh, Medicaid expansion in the states, and so there has, there's going to have to be off ramps, and there's going to have to be something that moves you to the next thing. And you know, the, the, I mean, they don't even operate from the assumption that there should be a next thing. So you know, a lot of the people in the in the conference. In Daniel, the, do you think there's a risk that this will wind up being the end game, and it will be a half baked solution? I'm hoping it'll be a half-baked solution. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the Medicaid piece of this is actually the piece that's working better for individuals because the federal government, in conjunction with the states, are picking up the tab, and so you don't have these problems of an insurance pool where there just aren't enough healthy people in it and, and premiums are going up. So it's, a, it's been a pretty good deal for the states thus far, and you know, obviously Medicaid's reimbursement rate is pretty low, so you do have limited choice in terms of your providers, but these are low-income people, many of whom did not have insurance before, and you got states like Arkansas, West Virginia, and, and Kentucky, extremely Republican states that have benefited enormously from this because they weren't, prior to that, they, you know, they weren't even covering all the people under the poverty line. So, look, I, I, I don't 
personally, I don't, I don't care about an off-ramp because I'd, I'd like to see more public health insurance. I, I think it works better. But um, in, in, terms of, in, in terms of just the way this fares politically, you know, here, here's an interesting idea, which is that just as Trump said, this thing could implode. So if this fails and Trump gets impatient with it, I do think that there's a decent chance that insurers will continue pulling out of the exchanges and, and premiums will continue to go up and, and the exchanges will in some way fall apart and you'll have all these individuals who are not eligible for Medicaid and don't get it through their job and will be in trouble. How that plays out politically, whether Democrats get blamed for it or Republicans now that they've at least started to try to reform the system, I'm not sure. But there's, there's also, uh, there, they've already taken away the penalties for not complying with the mandate. So, I mean, it's on a glad path to, dis to destruction now. Moving on, moving mm -hmm. on, my apologies. Mm -hmm. President Trump caused some major controversy this week by tweeting about possible wiretapping of Trump Tower before the election. Here's the story from CNN. Tonight, FBI officials are demanding a flat-out denial from the Justice Department, but not yet getting one. This after President Trump went on a Twitter tirade Saturday, tweeting, Terrible. Just found out that Obama had my wires tapped in Trump Tower just before the victory. Nothing found. How low has President Obama gone to tap my phones? Bad or sick guy? Brian, I'm curious not only about the potential validity to his accusations and allegations, but I'm also curious about the way he's handled the whole thing. Where do you stand on that? Um, uh, I, I think that his, you know, he's, his timing is, you know, he, he's hit him in the mouth. You know, Mike Tyson said everybody has a plan until you get hit in the mouth. And they're reeling this and trying to president. figure out. This is our president. Right. But, but okay. I mean, he, but he, he, uh, he has given them something that they had to stop and react to. Um, you know, they first said, no, there's no evidence. We absolutely didn't do this. Then, well, yeah, we did. We applied for, you know, three FISA warrants. FISA is a, pretty much a rubber stamp court, right? With, you know, so t the first two, they said, hey, you know, this is campaign related. This is not national security related and turned down their warrants. It was only the third time when they went back in October and took the focus off of Trump that they were able to get the warrants. The problem for the Democrats now is they listen in on a lot of stuff. They don't really have anything to show for it. There's not really any smoking guns that they overheard. So now uh, you have to get off of this without, you know, the political damage of, because otherwise you're looking at Watergate, bugging the uh, candidate of the other party. I mean, that's basically what it is at this point. Kelly, what's your position on this whole story? I, I you know, I'll take a little different tack here. I see unsubstantiated claims by President Trump that his that the Trump Towers were were bugged and he was being wiretapped. I also see unsubstantiated claims so far on the Democrat side who have been pushing this 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 um, this repeated claim that the the Trump administration or the then Trump campaign was somehow in collusion with the Russians to thwart the election. And they've been hammering at that ceaselessly um, and, and pretty, pretty um, hard to the point where, you know, they've they gotten uh, Sessions to, uh, you know, uh, Attorney General Sessions to recuse himself from the investigation. Um, you know, they thwarted uh, Mike Flynn. Um, so on and so forth. So, but what I see being lost here is a real debate about government surveillance because let's face it, you know, we've been talking about this for, or at least I've been writing about it for several years now about um, the government's broadened powers under the Patriot Act to spy on Americans using foreign surveillance, counter-terrorist authorities that they gained after 9-11. And the Democrats have missed every opportunity to tighten controls on the government um, and its spying on Americans. Um, and conservatives and Republicans have been so far um, uninterested, unless they're libertarians like Ron Paul. Um, so right now we have this circus going on where everybody's throwing, you know, cloak and dagger accusations. But I don't hear anybody saying, well, let's really reform a system in which there are these spying tools out there and they are being used for nefarious reasons. And I think that's being lost because, let's face it, Trump may be complaining about himself being bugged, but he, I, so far he doesn't seem to be interested in the rest of America being bugged. Daniel, do you agree that these are unsubstantiated allegations on both sides? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen it reported that they actually were able to get a FISA warrant that took them into a space where they were able to listen to Trump. And I, and I think that even if that were reported, Brian, and, and I'd, I'd be curious to see how, how you tell, push back on that, that, that is very, very different than a president going after someone for political reasons. Keep in mind, Obama sat on some of the evidence of Russian intervention in the election because he didn't want to be perceived as intervening. That doesn't sound like the conduct of someone that would use a personal vendetta, that would use the FBI like J. Edgar Hoover did in the 60s against various left-wing critics and against Martin Luther King. So th those are two separate things. It, it, look, President Trump is an, an impulsive person who's frankly, look, regardless of, of what I think of his policies and regardless of what I think of his political successes, which are considerable, he's an impulsive person and a, a vindictive and petty person. And, and that's the kind of thing that you're seeing in him tweeting in, in a way, because it's not just this. It, it's all kinds of theories and opinions, whatever seems to pop into his head. And quite frankly, it is extremely irresponsible for the President of the United States to use the bully pulpit to advance something like that without substantiation because what it then does is it gives fodder for conspiracy theories. And those aren't my words. Those are the words of Congressman Mike Rogers, who said that there's another quarter in the conspiracy theory meter, a Republican. Thank you, Daniel. And finally this week, millions of women around the world marked International Women's Day by taking part in the Day Without a Woman protest. But their absence from work caused many schools and other workplaces to shut down, causing hardship for many others. So, Kelly, do you think this was a day of unification or a day of polarization? Well, I mean, uh, as, as a woman in the media, I can only tell you what I, obse I have observed that day. I think um, as a media person, in the greater Washington, D.C. area, we saw two major school systems shut down within 24 hours before the event. So very little notice, particularly Prince George's County, um, Maryland, um, which had shut down, I believe it was, I want to say it was less than, you know, 18 hours, 12 hours even before the day without a woman. So there were a lot of women who, there were some women who showed up at the school with their children and not having childcare for that day. And I think that there was this feeling like, A, um, what is their message? I mean, they say they're striking, but what are they striking against? And some, some of the messages you heard filtering in was gender equality, um, gender pay equality, um, a lot of the same themes you saw in the Women's March. Well, that's because the women who plan this day are the same women who plan the, the Women's March two days or a day after the inauguration. And, I mean, right there, some people's political BS meter goes up because those marches were planned within days after the election out of anger and opposition to the election of Donald Trump. So right off the bat, that, that march, as big and as successful as it was for those women, was a politically driven march. And I think, I think women who did vote for Donald Trump or didn't vote for Hillary or don't feel like this political drive uh, feel a little left out of what they're being told is their movement. And I don't think all women are responding the same to this. Daniel, it sounds like Kelly's saying there is a, a vacuum in terms of strategy for the women's movement today. Where do you see there might be an opportunity to develop that strategy, to, to develop sort of a way ahead? Well, I would say because Kelly is right that it was a day that was planned by liberal activists and regardless of what they might tell you and I think it was open and welcome to other people's participation but because quite frankly it is planned by liberals they're not necessarily looking for con from conservatives for tips as to how to make it more politically effective I do think the substance of their message could have been clear um, but look the the idea of a strike is actually a, a powerful tool if, if you want to use it and that does, there is unfortunately collateral damage that, that, can, that can have real human impact when you're dealing with, with um, people that have to take care of their kids and find a way to deal with that. And I, and I think that that's, that's something that just needs to be dealt with better on a case-by-case -case basis. I have to say, I, my experience personally is that feminism has somehow become a tired topic that can't seem to have a real revival. 
Brian, do you think there's a chance for a, a way ahead for women to revive this topic in a way that really can make a difference? Well, it's, you know, like the, the major underpinnings of it are a problem. For one thing, even the Obama Department of Labor said the wage gap is the result of choices that women make, not systemic uh, uh, discrimination. discrimination. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but these are choices they yeah. make because of society as it currently is, the supports that currently <clears throat> exist, and the way men currently act in terms of their gender and their current rights or feelings of what is appropriate. So a lot of those things could change and give women more of the support so that they wouldn't need to make those choices. Oh, can, I, yeah. can I step in just for two seconds? Okay. The decision I made to stay home and have children for several years was my decision and I would have it no other way. But when I went back to work, I was in, I was in the same pay grade, if not less than I was when I came back, but I wouldn't do it any different way. I would have preferred to be at home than have my husband at home. So I think it's a little more complicated than just saying it's it's men's fault. Oh, I'm not yeah. saying it's men's fault. I'm saying but I, sometimes that message that comes through, is. and when you say you're striking, it sometimes came across yesterday, not by you know well-meaning people, but in you know Twitter feeds and Facebook that somehow men have to pay. They have to be shown that we are valuable. And I'm thinking, the guy sitting next to me at work's pretty valuable too. And if he didn't show up. I, you know. I just think there's a discernment to be made between it's men's fault and there are structures that aren't in place. But I hate to, can, I hate to I cut us off. Sorry. Say one <laughs> no. sentence in there, which is, there's a pretty small, to answer your question, there's a pretty small box of things that all women agree on politically now. Probably so. All right, let's take questions from our viewers. Clark Francis, he asks, if there was no wiretapping, then, how do we know that Michael Flynn was talking to the Russians? Who wants to take that first? Well, they were tapping the Russian ambassador, which is common. The Rus you know, if you're a Russian ambassador, you know, you're, <laughs> you know you're going to be bugged. <laughs> it's, it's part of the job. This is our ambassadors are bugged wherever they go to. <clears throat> Kelly, any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I, I, mean, I remember white. a year or so ago we were talking about, you know, the United States bugging Angela Merkel's mm. phone, mm. and the response from the Democrats and the administration was, well, everybody does it. Yeah. So it's like we're, we, were, we were told that everybody was doing it. We shouldn't be surprised that everybody's tapping everybody else now. I mean, it, it just seems... And, and the CIA thing yesterday, you know, they can watch you through your phone and so forth. So it's basically, you know, someone said today... You know, you have, I guess it was Comey said today, you have no expectation of privacy anymore. And I think that's probably right. Daniel, any thoughts? Well, I, I would just say to, to Kelly that though that was the Obama administration line, I think there were a lot of rank and file Democrats and progressives who are genuine civil libertarians and are very concerned about those sorts of issues. Interesting thing here. Trump has sort of, and, and, and Bannon have kind of exaggerated, they've been throwing around this idea that there's like a deep state plot to, to get them. But it does seem true that you know either the CIA or maybe former administration officials who had access to that intelligence are leaking this type of stuff. And in the case of Flynn, I think it was justified. Camille Walsh asks, Republicans have been wanting to repeal and replace Obamacare for years, so why is it taking them so long to find a replacement? Who wants to take that one? Well, it's a, it's a complicated thing. That's the thing about it. They're getting hit for, hey, you know, this is a rough start and... You know, you know, Trump said, you know, who knew it was this complicated? We all did. Yes, we all did. But it is complicated. And, it, you know, it's not, it's, this, what they're trying to do has never been done in American history, which is to take away an entitlement. We add them. We don't ever take them away. And here's one where we have targeted it for removal. And if they don't remove it, the, uh, the uh, majorities that Republicans enjoy now will be Democratic enjoy majorities within 10 years. I would say welfare reform uh, significantly diminished in entitlement, and I would say that there have been reforms to other programs that, that you could argue that, that played that role. Republicans, as a principle, do not particularly care about universal coverage, or they didn't until 2010, but now it's become a status quo. I think the most interesting thing about this is hearing people like Marco Rubio say they can't go back to the 2009 status quo, and they never thought that, that they, I think that the, that political reality is just setting in for them. Kelly? 
Well, no, I just I think that there are probably more people out there who would prefer universal health care coverage, and I don't think we've heard the end of that argument because I think it crosses uh, politi the political spectrum. I think you'd be surprised. Okay. And now it's time for the most underreported stories of the week. Who'd like to start? Um, I'll start, and I won't take much time because I took a little bit of your time. Um, we, we found out this week that we're sending Marines on the ground in, in Syria, and it has been reported, but I feel that it's been underreported because I think during the campaign there was an effort by both uh, uh, the campaigns to insist that they wouldn't put ground troops in Syria, and we're seeing uh, what might be a drip, drip, drip of, of ground troops in the area, so it's something to, to in, in Syria. So I think it's something to keep our eyes on. Brian? Um, two quick ones today. The... Uh, House passed legislation that will require the EPA to show the research on which it bases its uh, regulations. There's something called the Six City Studies out there that is used to underpin air pollution regulations, which underpins all the anti-coal regulations. And uh, those, you know, they've never shown it, and they say it's not our property. Well, the federal government paid for it, so yeah, it is our property. And it, the reason they won't show it is this long longitudinal study over 30 years doesn't say what the government's been saying. The other thing is, Monday morning, oil starts throw, fo flowing through the Dakota Access Pipeline, Ooh. which is a victory for American energy independence. It's a victory for American energy independent, uh, uh, oil dependence, I, I hear you. Um, and Daniel, what about yourself in terms of underreported uh, stories? Well, on Monday night, I reported there was a protest outside of the White House against Trump's revised travel ban. And uh, Tom Perez showed up, who was, the, who was the new chair of the Democratic National Committee. And the organizer of the protest was a supporter of Keith Ellison. And I think it's pretty unusual, typically, for the DNC chair to, to be that visible in an activism type event. And so it seems like it's a sign that there's a genuine attempt to, to mollify the different wings of the party and, and unite them. All right. Well, that's all we have for this week. I'm Donna Davis. Thanks for watching The Square Circle. We'll see you next week. have a passion for helping people, want to launch a new charity, or need to raise funds, Voluntary Solutions can help. You have a passion for helping people. We have a passion for helping you. Visit VoluntarySolutionsDC.com, 844-739-5488.